today, King George III. But of course, before I do that, I have to tell you uh, what I left out about Thomas Paine last week. And um, actually, what I'm going to do with uh, Thomas Paine, I had mentioned that in his later years, he was uh, pretty well despised by the United States and uh, many people because of his views, uh, his attack on uh, religion and the Bible. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about how John Adams and others felt about him and, and what they said. Uh, John Adams acknowledged him to be the, uh, the most influential person, uh, writer anyway, in the last 30 years. And this was uh, writing in about 1804. John Adams made this comment. He's the most influential man, uh, writer in the last 30 years. Uh, for John Adams, that was not a compliment. John Adams ridiculed the idea that that was the age of reason. Like uh, many of us, when we get to our uh, older years, we start looking at the society around us and thinking that uh, everything's going to hell in a handbasket. And uh, John Adams thought the same way. So he, he blamed uh, Thomas Paine for the, uh, the state of things in his, in his day, in the eight, early 1800s. Also, there was a three-volume history of the American Revolution that came out uh, about 1805, uh, written by a woman, by the way, which is uh, very unusual at, at, at that time. Um, uh, Mercy Otis Warren wrote this great three-volume history of the American Revolution came out in 1805. Thomas Paine got only a footnote in that three volume set. He was utterly despised. Thomas Jefferson in his later years started publishing his correspondence with various important people that he had known throughout his life. And someone asked him, well, why don't you publish your correspondence with Thomas Paine? He said, I, I wouldn't for the world. <laughs> I'd just as soon stick my head in a hornet's nest. Because <laughs> he knew that at one time he was friendly with Thomas Paine, and that was not a popular thing anymore. So yes, uh, Thomas Paine was utterly despised. Why was that again? His attacks on Christianity, oh, mainly. Oh, he hated organized religion. Uh, he, uh, in his uh, Age of Reason, he published. Oh, yeah. It was an attack on organized religion, and especially targeting the Bible, which he knew very well. So, yeah. So King George the Third. So, the books that I have on King George, I started out as usual. I always try to get a children's book, or at least a short uh, biography. Yes. You know what? I, 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 I have to keep them up because uh, when I'm when I'm filming this or I'm taping it or I, it's not taping, recording it. Uh, if I turn lights down, then the contrast uh, totally wipes this out. I hope that's okay. Um, so this first one. Um, Philip Brooks, this is actually a, a, a book that was published for grade school kids. Uh, a bit below what I normally would like to have as a short biography, but I couldn't find anything else. Um, so it's 128 pages, um, lots of nice pictures. He, uh, he tries to portray in the title, uh, he tries to build up the evilness of George III but in the contents of the book, he, he plays it pretty well. Um, so as, as a kid's book, it's actually done very well. Uh, the one thing that I would criticize um, 
there's a quote, there's actually a couple of quotes from supposedly King George III that people like to banter about as something that he had said or written. One of them is, um, he supposedly wrote on, in his diary, nothing special happened today, and the date was July 4th. <laughs> King George did not keep a diary. Oh. That did not happen. <laughs> How those things came about, you know, people like to make up stuff, and because uh, it sounds fun. Uh, there's another quote that uh, was used in this book um, that's something along the lines of, I intend nothing but good things for my people. Therefore, everyone who disagrees with me is a traitor and a scoundrel. <laughs> um, that actually came from a historian uh, in the mid-1800s who wrote uh, about George and wrote that out, not, supposing, not supposed to be a quote. It was something that the historian felt that he would think. And that was taken, and now many historians you know, kids' books especially. I've heard uh, that one. Yeah. Uh, they use it. Now, it's something that wouldn't be far from what he had thought, uh, honestly, but it's not something that he actually said or wrote. Um, the next one, uh, Chatham and the British Empire. This is actually about uh, one of the great statesmen of the day who had been prime minister for a few years, and, but previous to that he was uh, secretary of state. Um, the great William Pitt, and if you're talking to a British person, you must say, the great William Pitt. <laughs> and, or William Pitt the Elder, because there was a William Pitt the Younger as well. Um, I, I got this book several years ago, probably about 25, 30 years ago, uh, because I, at the time I was really into the American Revolution, and I, I came across this book, I thought I'd read it, and what, what stunned me, what really stood out, when I read this book was the fact that the British have a whole lot other problems to deal with than just the American colonies. And that's something that I'm gonna bring out today, that um, we think, when we, <clears throat> when we study the American Revolution, we tend to assume that the British government has nothing better to do than worry about what we're doing. And as a matter of fact, they have a whole lot of other problems to deal with. Um, Alan Lloyd, The King Who Lost America. This was very good as a general biography of, uh, of George III. And this is probably the, the one that I mainly stuck with to get a lot of my information. This last one, um, George III, America's Last King. It's, it's the type of book that you do not read until you already know a lot about King George because it is so thick with details about parliamentary procedures and the ins and outs of each of his prime ministers and the workings of parliament. Very detailed, somewhat dry, uh, and not, I would say, nice summer reading. Uh, you really need to know a lot about the, uh, what's going on before you get this book. Okay, so we're going to go back a little bit. Um, the beginnings, uh, George III was of the Hanover family dynasty. Um, what that, of course, is Germany. He was a German who came to, or his ancestors came to England. And the reason for that is Queen Anne, who reigned from 1702 to 1714, uh, did, did not have an heir. It was not for lack of trying. She had 16, 17 children. <laughs> 16 of them died in infancy. Oh. Talk about a heartbreak. This poor woman suffered awfully. Oh. The one that survived infancy died at age 11. Oh. So th this poor woman, uh, this, they say the last few years of her life, uh, she did not take care of herself. Uh, she was filthy, she did not want to dress up. Uh, everything was, she just didn't care about her appearance anymore and died a, a very bitter old woman. Um, so when she died, they had, Parliament had to search for the next in line and that was 
uh, her second cousin, who was from Hanover, uh, who became George I. He reigned from 1714 to 1727. George I did not like England, did not speak English, <laughs> and did not like the English people. <laughs> but what do you do when someone offers you a crown? <laughs> Take it. Um, so he reigned. Uh, he was a uh, kind of an angry, bitter sort of man. Uh, he hated his own family. Uh, George II, who reigned after him, he absolutely hated his own son. Um, and so when he died, uh, his son, George II, uh, came to the throne, 1727 to 1760. George II also did not speak English, was born in Hanover, and was uh, he came to England at the age of like 31. So he was born and raised in Germany, in Hanover, came to the throne at, uh, I forget what age, 45 or something. And, um, and he too did not like England. Uh, he, he actually tried to learn a little bit of English so he could speak it a little, not much. But he didn't care for the English much either. And then we come to George III. The grandson, um, by the way, George II also hated his son. And, um, yeah, oh yeah. And actually had him banished from court uh, the last few years of his reign, or, or uh, his life rather. Uh, his son died from, and uh, let's, see, let's see if I can pronounce this right, a pulmonary, pulmonary embolism. Did I say that right? I don't speak English well. <laughs> so, I, so he had a lung problem, a clot or something, um, and he died, uh, which made the next in line, George III, uh, reigned after his grandson passed away. Uh, George II um, was actually not upset that his son died. Uh, and he said so. He was quite open about that. Uh, he was uh, somewhat more tolerant of his grandson, um, so he had he wasn't quite so awful. So he was born June third, seventeen thirty eight. He was the first Hanoverian to be born in England. Um, so his father died. Like I said, uh, he was twelve years old when his father died. Um, they say he, when he was raised, he had a very sheltered, uh, even by the standards of the day, he had a very sheltered upbringing. Uh, they said he was a moderately decent student, uh, but somewhat lazy uh, as a kid. Um, he loved to criticize people uh, as a young kid. Uh, not a good sign for someone who's going to grow up to be a king. And as a teenager, he met, uh, Lord Bute, and chose him as his favorite. Uh, Bute uh, had the unfortunate characteristic of being a Scotsman. Scotland and England had united in the early 1700s and were now one country. That did not mean that the English liked the Scots or the Scots liked the English. They did not. Bute was considered a foreigner and people resented him terribly. And there he is. Butte. He was actually, he was six years older than uh, George and uh, actually a friend of his father's and that's how they knew each other. There was rumors that uh, Butte had an affair with George's mother after the father passed away but that's completely unconfirmed. So, George II dies October 25th, 1760. Um, I'll back up a little bit. George had actually fallen in love with a, uh, uh, someone that he had met from a well-to-do family, but she was not royalty. Very beautiful woman. George was madly in love. Uh, he was about 18 at the time, and um, he desperately wanted to marry her. Butte and his mother told him, no, you cannot marry her. You have to marry someone of a royal line. 
and it was very bitter for him to accept that, but he did. Uh, upon becoming the king, when his uh, grandfather died, um, he chose about that time uh, Princess Charlotte. Again, she was from one of the German states, and um, it was a very quick engagement and wedding. She arrived in England on September 8th at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> they were married at 9 o'clock that evening. <laughs> and uh, the rush, I suppose, the wedding probably wasn't all that important to them. The coronation was. So they had a huge celebration for their uh, uh, coronation, and that was September 22nd, uh, 1761. They hadn't met before. No, no, no. They had, uh, but by all accounts, it was a good match. Um, they suited each other well. They seemed to uh, have uh, corresponding uh, likes and dislikes, and so uh, for the most part, they, they seemed to be uh, very happy together. Um, and they had 15 children. Yes, they managed. Yeah. They must have got along well. Yes. Yeah, so they, they had 15 children together, and um, they had a pretty good record of uh, children that survived. Only two of them died in infancy. So that was a pretty good record for the day. Uh, what happened between 1760 when his grandfather died? And, uh, so the coronation the is, ju is the ceremony that, oh. that just announces to the world that he's now king. He, technically, legally speaking, as soon as the grandfather dies, he is king. Yeah. Yeah. But the coronation doesn't have to happen right away. Yeah. So here's a, a portrait. I, I said before, I wish they would do more family portraits back in those days. And when you're royalty, you can do that. So this is uh, when they only had six children. Pretty looking family. Question. Yes. He, he always appears to be a very tall man. He Are was. Are there recordings of how tall he was? You know, I know I've read this. I'm, I'm guessing around six feet. Uh, I'm not sure on that, though. But yeah, he was a, a tall man for his day. So, um, they were both, uh, as I say, uh, pretty well matched. They enjoyed the arts and uh, music together. George uh, enjoyed playing the flute, and she played the harpsichord. Uh, and they actually invited a very young Mozart to play, to perform for them uh, at one point. And um, she, especially Charlotte, uh, loved gardening. And when you have, if you've ever been to England and seen the beautiful English gardens out there, this isn't like we're going to uh, make a row of, of corn and, and plant, you know, squash and, and stuff like that. This is like huge gardens that she was into, and she had, of course, lots of help as well. But um, that was what she enjoyed doing. And George had a daily routine. When he grew up, he was not uh, as he was, uh, in his younger years, a, a somewhat of a lazy sort of kid. Uh, he grew up to be a very hardworking man. Um, he had a very strict schedule. Uh, he was very methodical. Uh, worked many hours a day. He'd get up at 5 o'clock every morning. Uh, he would make his own fire in the fireplace there in the room. Uh, and then he would spend time writing letters and memos uh, for a number of hours. And he would always have just one piece of toast for breakfast. He did not want to get overweight, as uh, some in his family had. He was a very moralistic man, strict morals, and uh, one of the rare kings uh, in history who did not cheat on his wife. Um, he believed, he was very religious, of course, uh, he ordered that there be no dancing on Sundays. Um, he limited the amount that people could gamble. He knew he wasn't going to get rid of gambling altogether, but he felt it was a sin to gamble much. 
Uh, and he did it himself, by the way, uh, but he always made sure that he limited the amount that he was gambling and ordered that uh, everyone follow in his example. Um, he did not drink. Uh, and he also uh, knew of the uh, dangers of alcoholism and uh, enacted a tax on uh, alcohol, various sorts of alcohol, ale and cider, and uh, which made him rather unpopular, as you might imagine. Um, and he was not as religiously bigoted as many in his day were. He actually was okay with the nonconformists, the Quakers, the Methodists. Um, he kind of, he especially kind of liked the Methodists because he was a very methodical person himself. Um, so, so there's a quote here that um, our royal purpose and resolution to discountenance and punish all manner of vice, profaneness, and immorality in all persons of whatsoever degree and quality within this our realm. So he was going to stamp out immorality. Uh, and he was especially targeting uh, the court, the people that he could uh, manage within his own view. And he was very parsimonious. He was stingy to an extreme. Um, he, he was well known to be a lousy tipper <laughs> when he hired uh, artists to do portraits. Uh, they didn't like it because they knew that he was cheap and he was not going to pay well. Um, so that was made him, again, somewhat unpopular. It's one of those, it's kind of interesting, um, if you are a king and you have a wonderfully lavish court, say like Henry VIII did, um, it's a great thing and people love to see it, but you're spending an awful lot of money to do it and people get upset at you because you're being ta they're being taxed. If you're parsimonious like King George, um, people look at you and say that they kind of despise that sort of thing but uh, they don't think that uh, they're saving on taxes. So you kind of get it both ways. Um, yeah. right. So uh, the, uh, the etiquette of the day, of course, is that when you are in the king's presence, you always stand. You remain standing. Only on certain occasions uh, may you ever sit, and there are not many. If, there, if you are invited to the court, to listen to a performance, and you are there, uh, the king is there, you stand through the whole performance. Even pregnant women had to stand. And when one of them in particular asked, you know, could I sit down? You say, no, you cannot sit in the king's presence. And so on some occasions, the friends of this particular woman would hide her behind the guards and uh, let her sit down. Uh, there in the king's presence. And by the way, you're not supposed to cough or sneeze. <laughs> uh, it's only in the king's presence. I, I will allow it. <laughs> the graciousness of my heart. <laughs> um, and of course, you are not to turn your back on the king, ever. When the, you are in the king's presence, you approach him going forward, and you walk away going backwards. He was an active man. He loved to go hunting. He could ride all day long uh, in whatever weather ha presented itself at the time. And as you know, England is a very rainy place. And when he went hunting, it didn't matter. He would go hunting, and he could go all day uh, out in the rain and the mud. Um, so I have a, a little story here from his equerry. And I had to look that one, of course, that, how to pronounce that. I wasn't entirely sure, but as you might guess, an equerry is the guy who takes care of the horses. Um, so uh, Goldsworthy, Colonel Goldsworthy uh, tells this story about uh, one time he was out with the king. And when they returned, uh, this was like one of those rainy days, they were out in the rain and the mud all day long, and he's just beat. He says, we returned like a bunch of drowned rats. 
And so the king says, here, Goldsworthy, uh, cries his majesty. Sir, says I, smiling agreeably, with rheumatism just creeping all over me, <laughs> but still expecting something a little comfortable. I wait patiently to know his gracious pleasure. And then, here, Goldsworthy, I say, will you have a little barley water? <laughs> barley water, that's what he was offered. <laughs> Goldsworthy is thinking, how about a little brandy, maybe, or something nice? But no, he was offered barley water. George was made fun of in his early years reigning as king because he loved to go out on his own and talk with the farmers. Uh, he, he acted as if he could relate well with them. He really couldn't. But, you know, no farmer is going to say that. And so here's uh, a lampooning of him uh, going around talking to this poor farmer, getting up in his face and talking about, you know, what the farmer does. And that's uh, Charlotte, the queen, behind him. They're making fun of her, too. And interestingly enough, in his early years as king, uh, that was a term of derision, Farmer George. As he got old and they started feeling for him, Farmer George was a term of endearment. William Pitt, the great commoner. When uh, George ascended the throne, he was at the kind of the near the end of the Seven Years' War. The Seven Years' War, the first couple of years, were going very badly for England until William Pitt took charge. He became the Secretary of State and turned things around. And for me, it's kind of interesting that um, the Secretary of State, of all people, would become the hero of the people. Um, it was not so much the generals who were winning the battles out in the field. It was William Pitt that everybody cheered uh, at the end of all this, he became a great hero, and that's where he became the, uh, uh, the great commoner because he was in the House of Commons. Um, so when George became king, uh, he wanted an end to this war. Uh, to his credit, uh, George hated war, and he did not want to seek out wars of conquest just for the sake of uh, being a great conqueror. Uh, but at, in this case, he wanted an end to the war. He was, they were going to sign a peace treaty with France, and uh, William Pitt was saying, we're not ready yet. Spain is on the horizon. Spain is going to attack. We need to keep going and take care of Spain first, and George uh, wasn't going to have it. Um, uh, George was under the impression, first of all, <coughs> Anybody who stood up to the king is not going to be popular with the king because he didn't like that sort of thing. Uh, William Pitt um, was the type of guy who would stand up to anybody. He was feared more than anyone in the House of Commons. It was said that he could stand up and harangue people and they would tremble in their seats uh, for fear that he was looking at them. Um, and so Pitt was not going to back down. So George... Uh, wanted to really take charge as king at this point. When he wanted something and people disagreed with him, the ministers uh, said no, he wanted to assert himself. He was only 22 when he became king, and um, he felt that he needed to establish his authority, which, by the way, his grandfather and great-grandfather had lost a lot of authority because they were not very assertive kings. Uh, they were angry and bitter old men, but uh, they were not assertive when it came to parliament. Yes? The Seven Years' War, this is the war that on this side of the Atlantic is the French and Indian War. Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, the French and Indian War, the Seven Years' War, if you're in India, you call it something else too. Uh, because it went all the way. It was, some people call it the First World War because it was everywhere that the British uh, Empire was. Um, so, so King George thought that he was going to assert himself and um, stand up to William Pitt. And William Pitt, so this is the way it was going to work out. 
He's going to stand up to him. William Pitt is going to have to resign as Secretary of State, and the people will love me because I stood up for him, and I am a, now a, uh, a strong, assertive king, and people will love that. Well, they didn't love it. They loved William Pitt. They did not care for the king standing up to him and making him resign. Uh, the king became very unpopular because of that. Uh, it was terribly galling to uh, the king that um, William Pitt was far more popular than him. If William Pitt was in his coach going down the street or, or there's a gathering, they're going to meet at parliament, the people would cheer. If there was a particular event, they would cheer in the streets and, uh, and scream and cry in emotion for seeing this great commoner. And then when the king came by in his coach, it was a polite little applause. It was glaringly obvious that the king was not nearly as popular as William Pitt. And there he is, William Pitt, the great commoner. <coughs> so once uh, William Pitt was out of the way, he still needed to have Parliament vote uh, for the peace process. Uh, and he knew that Pitt, who was still a member of Parliament, um, held sway. And so he knew that he had to do what he uh, really didn't want to do, and that was to bribe enough uh, members of Parliament to get the vote. Um, this was, interestingly enough, a, uh, a turn in history, a, a, a sea change, you might say, a very slow change, but uh, a very discernible change going on in English history, and that is people were getting tired of the corruption and the bribery that was commonplace. Uh, many people would say that uh, they knew the price of each individual uh, member of parliament uh, for a particular vote. And so uh, the king knew that if he wanted peace, he needed to pay for it. And he needed to hire a man to do it for him. And that was Henry Fox. Um, so he gave he, Henry Fox thousands and thousands of pounds to bribe individual members of parliament. And for his efforts, uh, he said ahead of time, if I'm going to do this for you, you need to make me uh, a peer. And that was, he was going to be a baron. And so he got what he wanted. Uh, William Pitt spoke out against this peace process for three and a half hours, and it did him no good. Uh, the money uh, was more important. And so the vote, 319 to 65, for the peace. The king won. Of course, uh, the king also lost because uh, shortly after the peace was signed, they had to declare war on Spain anyway. Because as Pitt had expected, uh, Spain had a secret treaty with France to uh, unite and attack. Fortunately, uh, once they attacked Spain, they dispatched them very quickly. Um, and it was largely due to the efforts of William Pitt in organizing the, uh, the Navy and the military, um, that it was very quick. And so they finally got their peace once they destroyed Spain. So um, the other thing that's, that's interesting about back in these days, having a prime minister was something that was actually somewhat new in the 1700s. And it was not uh, a regular uh, election that would bring in a new prime minister. Uh, King George, from 1760 to 1770, uh, had seven of them. He would go through one after the other, trying to find one that could work the government well. And um, it, was, it was not an easy process. Throughout this whole time, uh, the government in Great Britain was was constantly turning over. Once um, he became king, he, what he really wanted, of course, was his favorite, Butte, to be the prime minister and just have him through his whole reign. Uh, but that wasn't going to work out because, as I said, he was a foreigner. He was from Scotland. 
And uh, people didn't like that. People hated him. And by the time of the vote, uh, the, for the peace vote, um, after that, uh, he was so hated that he begged the king to resign because he just could not take the pressure anymore. Everybody blamed him for it. Um, and there's Butte. And so once uh, Butte left office, he had to get a new prime minister, and he had uh, George Grenville uh, from 63 to 65, uh, a man who is very much in character uh, like the king, and that was not a good thing. They were both very bullheaded, uh, both hardworking, um, but they are both uh, used to having their way. And George Grenville was not shy about telling the king how he felt about everything. The king actually dreaded having to talk with Grenville because he would drone on and on and on, lecturing the king about all the rights and wrongs of the empire and how to run the government. And the king would just suffer terribly listening to him. Um, but again, like George, he was not only very hardworking, but he was honest, and he hated the corruption in the government. So here's George Grenville. The king was so desperate to find somebody to take his place, because he couldn't stand being lectured to, uh, he actually went to William Pitt and asked him, please come and take over. And, and actually, this was uh, Butte's suggestion that the king go to William Pitt and, uh, and ask him to be the prime minister. Uh, the king hated that idea because he didn't like William Pitt at all, but he was desperate. So. He asked, they had a little negotiation back and forth, and William Pitt said, if I'm going to be prime minister, I need to call the shots. I need to choose my cabinet, and I'm going to run the government. And the king couldn't take that. So uh, Grenville, of course, found out that uh, he was looking for another prime minister. And so Grenville came to him and said, look, I'm going to quit myself if you're going to treat me this way. And again, he had to harangue the poor king for hours about what he was doing wrong. And the king, not having an alternative, had to stick with Grenville. Grenville had uh, now his own demands to make. Get rid of Butte. He's the one who's always telling you what to do. I want him banished from court. He needs to live at least 30 miles away. And so, uh, he granted that, and that broke his heart because Butte was like his only friend in the world. But there were other things happening. The cider tax that was in England um, was very unpopular. People in England were hating George more and more and his ministers, Grenville. And of course, at this time we have uh, the colonists who were having their problems with the stamp tax. Mm -hmm. And that also was Grenville's idea. So finally, the king said, okay, I can finally get rid of him. I don't care who I'm going to get. I'm gonna grab this, the nearest guy. And this was Lord Rockingham, uh, a novice, uh, someone the king was hoping that he could manage. Um, but uh, so he called in Lord Rockingham um, to deal with the colonists, they were going to take off, get rid of the Stamp Act. Um, and uh, as I say, uh, Rockingham was uh, somewhat friendly to the Americans. He liked them. And this whole process was very difficult for the king. The king did not like the idea of getting rid of the Stamp Act. He was uh, quite upset about it. Um, Uh, so, uh, now I lost my train of thought. I'll get it back right real quick here. Uh, so the king uh, was in this whole maneuvering of dealing with the Stamp Act. Uh, Grenville, who was still a member of parliament, 
I was adamant that we keep the Stamp Act, that it would be a shame, it would be a, a terrible embarrassment that if they did away with the Stamp Act. So he, uh, he actually went to see uh, Butte out in his cottage 30 miles outside of town and begged him to talk to the king and uh, help him change his mind. And Butte, uh, of course, probably reveled in this, uh, this little incident and quite curtly told him no, he wasn't going to get him anything. So here's Rockingham. Uh, wait, not that yet. Um, so about this time, there are other issues going on in uh, England. And one of them was a man named John Wilkes. John Wilkes was a rabble rouser. He was the type of guy that you like sometimes from a distance. Uh, up close, uh, you got to be careful. He was a publisher of a newspaper, uh, North Britain, and he would publish some scandalous sorts of things. Um, he was also, so here's John Wilkes, and this is actually a book that came out about him. Um, so if you're interested, you can look up John Wilkes and there's an interesting biography on him. Um, but uh, he was the type of guy that uh, he loved having a good time. He was a member of a club called the Hellraisers. <laughs> you can imagine what they do on Saturday nights. Um, they loved having a good time. They'd have these big drunken parties and uh, they would do crazy things. Uh, one incident that, that I read about was that they had a ceremony, uh, kind of like a, a Catholic mass, and they were serving mass to a, a monkey, uh, to an ape, kind of mocking that whole thing. Um, John Wilkes, they say, was fascinatingly ugly. Of course, the, the paintings that you see are only going to be an approximation. Um, but um, so they say that uh, he had very bad teeth or very few of them. Um, he had a flattened nose like a boxer and very squinty eyes. Um, but he was very intelligent and he was very funny. Uh, the, the guys who would hang out with him uh, would have a great old time. He was just hilarious. He could have been a stand-up comic. Um, I'm sorry, Hellfire Club, not the Hell Razors. <laughs> Got to get that straight. And so once he started publishing about all the chaos that was going on in the king's uh, cabinet with the ministers uh, constantly changing, he would lampoon them. Um, and so, of course, he was arrested for libel. Um, but he was so popular amongst the people that the sheriff was very afraid of doing this. He was arrested, but then released uh, right away. Uh, someone challenged him to a duel. Uh, he took the challenge and was wounded in the side. Uh, at that point, he realized that he needed to leave, and so he fled to France. Um, of course, there were riots in the streets over all this because he was such a popular man. Um, and, uh, oh, this other one, number 45. When they print articles, oftentimes they would have numbers for them. And so number 45 became kind of a, a theme of the people. And when they would riot in the streets and they would chase down the uh, aristocracy or members of parliament, sometimes they would stop them uh, in their coaches and paint 45 on the side of their coach. If they were a really unfortunate a member of parliament, they would stop them, haul them out, and tear apart their coach. Uh, so yeah, the, uh, the uh, members of parliament, that's what MPs, by the way, in case you're wondering, members of parliament uh, often were harassed because of him. Um, so uh, there's an interesting story. Once he got into France, uh, he met with uh, the famous Madame de Pompadour of the, the famous hairdo, um, and she said to him, um, how far can you abuse the royal family? And he answered, 
Uh, that is what I intend to find out. <laughs> So now we come to America. Look at this, I'm almost done and I have to, now we're getting to the colonies. Um, in Great Britain, uh, especially among the upper classes, the colonies were the backwoods yokels who did not need to be uh, respected very highly. They were the children that uh, needed to be treated like children and um, their opinions could be uh, disregarded at will. They should be dependent on the mother country for trade and protection. Um, they are like children, as I say, who should be grateful to their parents. And as you know, uh, the 13 colonies in America were only 13 among many other colonies. They also had Canada to support or to look after. There was India, some territories in India. There's the West Indies, uh, a number of islands. Uh, so, the 13 colonies were only 13 among many others. So the Stamp Act 1765, as I said, originated with Grenville, um, supported by the king, of course, and not many people were arguing against it. Parliament passed it with a huge majority. Um, when the Stamp Act riots came about, and there was they finally realized that they could not enforce this law. Uh, they knew they had to repeal it. Um, and the king made a very telling quote. Where this spirit will end is not to be said. This is undoubtedly the most serious matter that ever came before parliament. Little did he know how far this was going. And so the Stamp Act eventually had to be repealed because it wasn't doing any good. Um, and asked, he finally asked Pitt to come and become prime minister. And so he does. Um, but, oh wait, I'm jumping ahead of myself. Um, one of Pitt's arguments in Parliament, he spoke up and saying, these are sons, not bastards. I rejoice that America has resisted. The gentleman asked when the colonies were emancipated, but I desire to know when they were made slaves. So that was his argument. And uh, also, once the, key, the uh, act was repealed, there, were gr there was great rejoicing in the colonies, and many throughout the 13 colonies were drinking a toast to the king and showing, demonstrating their loyalty to the British crown. And in New York, they uh, raised a statue to King George uh, on a horse. And that, was, that stood up in uh, a central place in New York to show their gratitude that uh, he would care for them and remove this hated tax. So there's King George's statue that they raised in New York. So William Pitt, as I say, became prime minister. Um, he was given a peerage, um, the Earl of Chatham. This lost him a lot of popularity uh, amongst the British people because he was no longer a commoner. He was in the House of Lords now. Um, but unfortunately, he was uh, very elderly at this point. He was uh, late 60s, which is a lot for back in those days, <laughs> I must say. Uh, but he, he suffered, as many uh, elderly people in those days suffered from gout, one of the worst maladies that uh, people, most common, I should say, that uh, people suffered from back in those days. Uh, when you read biographies of various people, um, when they get old, they almost universally are suffering from gout. Terribly painful. But he was also emotionally uh, worn out from all of the fighting that he had done in Parliament. And for a number of months, even though he was Prime Minister, he had nothing to do with the government. He, was, he had to stay at home. And he was, uh, his friends and family knew that they couldn't bring up anything uh, government related because he would sometimes just break down and cry. He was so broken uh, emotionally. 
And so because of that, uh, the king talks with uh, the chancellor of the exchequer, Charles Townshend. And so he says, uh, look, we still need taxes. So if the Americans don't want an internal tax, we'll give them an external tax, a duty on several items, and we'll raise money that way. And so Charles agreed. Charles knew that the prime minister, uh, William Pitt, did not like that and would not have allowed it. But uh, he was not available. He was uh, at home uh, suffering with his gout and emotional stress. And so the Townshend duties passed. And now we have a, a short interlude uh, to other problems. Uh, John Wilkes returned from France in uh, 1768, uh, believing that the, uh, the Fuhrer had died down and so he could safely come back to England. And he was right. He was still very popular and he came back and nobody was going to arrest him at first. So he wanted to run for parliament. He was wildly popular and knew that he could win. So he ran for parliament and the Wilkites, his followers, uh, so harassed and intimidated the opposition that nobody dared <coughs> uh, run against him openly. And so 45 once again became the theme um, and was painted everywhere. King George was outraged. He couldn't stand this man. Uh, he was against everything that George believed in. Um, and so he had Wilkes arrested. Uh, kind of a comical scene when he was first arrested. Uh, he was put in a coach and was being taken to the prison. The crowds stopped the coach, released the horses, took John Wilkes out, and they all went to the nearest tavern and got drunk. <laughs> Wilkes, uh, to his credit, knew that he needed to turn himself in. So he broke away from the party and turned himself in and went to jail, uh, believing that uh, he would prevail in the end. Uh, and so he, oh, something else. During this time, the, the rioting because of all this, um, the Riot Act was a law that was passed several years uh, previous. Uh, does anybody know what the Riot Act is? You ever, I'm sure you've heard of that, read them the Riot Act, right? Yeah. <laughs> what that is, it's an actual law uh, in England that if there is a riot, you have the soldiers out there ready to shoot. They cannot shoot into the crowd until the Riot Act is read. And so you have a, uh, someone, a, an official sheriff or somebody comes out with the paper and reads the Riot Act. Once he has read that Riot Act, then they can shoot at the crowd. So that's where that comes from. And so uh, the officials came out and read the Riot Act. Yes? I want to know what was in 45. OK, so uh, it, was, it was basically lampooning the ministry. The, the king, he act, what he did was, how many of you have heard of uh, Alexander Pope, the poet? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Alexander Pope wrote a poem, Essay on Man. Have you ever read that one, Essay on Man? <laughs> Great work. Um, so Wilkes wrote Essay on Woman, which was basically uh, lampooning the ministry and making fun. I mean, he was a funny guy, as I've said. And uh, I, I, I can't give you details, but that's kind of the gist of what that was about. <clears throat> So it was a parody of Pope's. Uh, well, it was a parody using Pope. It wasn't against Pope. It was against okay. the, the British right. ministry and the king, yeah. And so here's a cartoon of Wilkes being carried. Another theme was Wilkes and liberty, because, of course, he was all for freedom of the press. And many people believe that he's, he represented uh, the people far better than the uh, parliament did. So he went to trial. He was sentenced to two years and fined 1,000 pounds. 
uh, the 1,000 pounds was quickly collected by the populace and paid. Uh, he was, even though he was in jail, he was elected to parliament anyway. <laughs> the king uh, disallowed that, uh, parliament disallowed it, and held another vote. He was elected a total of three different times while he was in prison. They were not going to allow anybody else to be voted in. Um, so he eventually he served one year of that sentence and was released. And in his later years, they say he, he mellowed out quite a bit. And um, he became an alderman in London and eventually was uh, elected again to parliament and served. Um, and even as years later, as I say, he was very mellowed out. And the king ran into him and said, uh, talk, asked him about a particular friend and said, um, so uh, the king said, so what, uh, whatever became of such and such friend of yours? And Wilkes said, friend, sir, he was no friend of mine. He was a Wilkite, and I never was. <laughs> so in 1770, the king finally finds the minister, the prime minister that is going to serve him uh, for a number of years and not uh, fail in a couple of years. So Grafton was the last one who uh, pretty much failed in his job. Frederick North becomes the prime minister, 1770. North is the type of guy that uh, King George can get along with. He's easygoing, he's still very intelligent, but he has a bright uh, outlook on life. Um, people would make fun of North because he looked a bit odd himself. Uh, he was very heavy set. He had a huge mouth, kind of bulging eyes, and uh, he was made fun of, but he was okay with it. He was all, always, they say, a fairly cheerful sort of guy. And he was very loyal to the king and did not care about being popular. So there's Frederick North. So North became the prime minister and stayed for the next 12 years and dealt with the Americans. The Townshend duties uh, had to be repealed except for the, the uh, tax on the tea. Um, the East India Company, as we know, uh, was going bankrupt. The king, the ministry was going to give the East India Company a great deal saying that you can ship your tea directly to the colonies. You don't have to go through a middleman in England, as the law normally would state. You can go directly to the colonies. The tax will still be there, but it'll be cheaper than the smuggled tea that they're getting from Holland. So how can the colonists resist that? Uh, well, they did, of course. Uh, the Bostonians dumped the tea into the harbor, had the Boston Tea Party, and many of the friends of America in Parliament uh, and even in the colonies were uh, outraged at this. Uh, William Pitt uh, believed that uh, that was a terrible outrage. This type of criminality should not uh, exist. And so the friends of the Americans said that there should be some consequences. They should pay for the tea. There should be reparations. That is what we should demand. And of course, the king wanted to go much further than that and punish the colonies severely for it. Uh, the Boston Port Bill closes the harbor, restricts the voting rights. Uh, the council and the judges are chosen by uh, the king or the governor. And so the colonies, seeing that, uh, again, the king has gone too far, are going to back Boston. So, William Pitt was the man who was going to stand up for the colonies. The Earl of Sandwich, and yes, that sandwich, <laughs> was going to be for the ministry, for the, the crown, he was going to be the attack dog that spoke out against the Americans. Uh, the arguments in Parliament, uh, Pitt proposes a compromise that uh, if Britain would 
uh, renounced the Declaratory Act, and the colonists acknowledged allegiance to the crown and paid uh, an unspecified amount, um, that should be acceptable to all parties, and leave it at that. Uh, of course, uh, Sandwich was not going to stand for that. And let's see, I know I got a <coughs> quotes here. Somewhere, okay. So in Parliament, as they were arguing back and forth, um, Ben Franklin was there observing. Ben Franklin had been an advisor to uh, William Pitt and helping him along with his speech and giving him pointers. And uh, everybody knew that. And Ben Franklin's there in the audience and Sandwich sees him and uh, says, I fancy I have my eye on the person who drew up this compromise one of the bitterest and most mischievous enemies this country has ever known. To which uh, William Pitt answers, the plan is my own, yet I make no scruple to declare that were I the first minister of this country and had the care of, and s s and the care of settling this momentous business, I should not be ashamed to publicly, of publicly calling to my assistance a person so perfectly acquainted with the whole of American affairs as the gentleman alluded to and so injuriously reflected on, one whom all Europe holds in high estimation. So he was very uh, fervent in his uh, denunciation of the ministry's policies as Sandwich was uh, in defending them. And here's Earl of Sandwich. <laughs> of course, I can't leave it at this. The, uh, the story goes that the Earl playing cards, uh, he liked playing cards a lot, of course. And so in order to um, ease, make eating a bit easier, he got a couple pieces of bread, put some meat between it, and would eat that. And he did that so often that uh, people started calling that the sandwich. Now, um, that's only half true. <laughs> it is named for him. Uh, having bread and meat is a sandwich because he did that so often that they started calling it a sandwich. It is not true that he invented it, though. Uh, bread and meat has been something that has been eaten together for thousands of years. And uh, historians who look into this sort of thing will tell you that in the literature, you will hear people talking about uh, having bread and meat or bread and cheese, very common meal. And so uh, the Earl is the one who gave it a name. So instead of just calling it, uh, hey, I'll have some bread and meat, you say, I'll have a sandwich. So that's how that came about. So they are preparing for war. They are ordering supplies, clothes, uh, munitions, cannons. And King George uh, stated, I am not sorry that the line of conduct it seems now chalked up. He wants this to happen. He's not a man who likes war, but he knows that it, sometimes it's got to happen. And he's got to stand up to these colonists for uh, the uh, the pride of Great Britain, or the whole uh, edifice will fall. He felt that if they lost the Americans, uh, that the whole empire would crumble. The Secretary of War, by the way, uh, actually argued against going to war. He knew that it would be, be very costly, far more costly than it would be worth, and um, he just hated the idea of the horrors of war. This is a civil war. And he knew that America was a large, vast expanse of territory <laughs> that could not be uh, attacked everywhere. And that was uh, William Lord Barrington was the Secretary of War. But the war begins. Lexington and Concord, and then Bunker Hill. The king hires the German Hessian mercenaries <coughs> 
which was very unpopular by a lot of people, especially the Americans. And uh, Pitt himself said, upon hearing that the Germans were going to be fighting against the Americans, if I were an American with foreign troops on my soil, I would never lay down my arms. Never, never, never. <laughs> and it was said that uh, Frederick the Great uh, had these troops passing through his territory. And he said, he joked that he was going to charge them the cattle tax because there are just so much cattle that's passing through being bought and sold. Independence, as we know, was July 2nd, uh, was not, did not impress uh, King George much at all. He had felt that they had declared independence much earlier than that. He didn't m really take note of the fact that they had officially uh, <laughs> declared independence. And to him, it made no difference. But it was celebrated all across uh, America. And in celebration of that, they tore down the statue that they had just a few years earlier built for King George, melted it down to make bullets. So to fight statue, King George. So Not, the statue was made of lead? Some of it, yeah. I'm sure it was, there's different mixtures, but yeah, it's basically a lead statue. Oh. So the war drones on. British troops, uh, as we know, were kicked out of Boston. Uh, General Howe chased Washington across New, jo New York and New Jersey. Uh, Was Washington turns the tables captures the Hessians at Trenton, and then the real turn of events was when Burgoyne cat was captured at Saratoga, in, and the news, I have November 1777, it was really October, but the news reached England in November, and that, here's Saratoga, and by the way, this character right here was the real hero of Saratoga, which was Benedict Arnold. But uh, we'll talk about him next week. When King George heard about this, he was visibly shaken for days. He had his normal levy in which people walk by and watch him eat like uh, kings in Europe did. And he, they say that he was so shaken by this that he tried to cover it up with laughter or conversation. He was, uh, he was the type of guy who could talk endlessly, and it was often a nervous sort of chatter. And they said he was particularly chatty and nervous and had an awkward smile uh, at this time, trying to cover up the, uh, the disaster. Uh, North, his prime minister, said, you know what, we need to call this off. We need to put an end. We need to make peace with the Americans. Uh, and I will resign if you don't agree. We shouldn't be fighting on. This is too costly, both in lives and money. Uh, George persuaded him otherwise. No, we are going to fight on to the bitter end. I'm not going to give up. <coughs> um, so North says, look, why don't we call in William Pitt to be part of the cabinet ministry, and that will bolster us in the eyes of the people. The people initially, by the way, um, were very much in favor of this war. The first time George was really popular was the beginning of the war. Uh, that didn't last very long. Once wars start going bad, uh, you become very unpopular very quickly. And so he said, why don't we bring in Pitt to bolster our popularity uh, for this war? Pitt being uh, now very infirm, was still occasionally showing up for Parliament, uh, but the gout was taking a terrible toll on him, and um, he agreed, but, um, and he actually spoke out in Parliament against the peace treaty. Pitt was very much in favor of American rights. He was never in favor of American independence and thought it would be a disaster. Uh, for both England and the Americans. So he gave a speech, his last speech on the floor, and then he collapsed uh, and died soon afterward. 
So here's, I was hoping for a better picture, but uh, this is Pitt in Parliament uh, collapsing right here. And once more, we have some more riots. The, this time, they were the Gordon riots of 1780. This was in response to the Catholic Relief Act of 1778 that gave basic rights to Catholics. Um, Catholics before this had not been able to buy and sell land. They could not have religious services, nor could they be promoted in uh, military or in government. This act in 1778 uh, gave them these basic rights. Gordon uh, was a man from Scotland. Scotland was the first to really be against this. Hardcore Protestants up in Scotland rioted uh, almost right away when this act passed. Uh, when Gordon came to Parliament from Scotland, uh, he introduced a bill to take back uh, the Catholic Relief Act. And many people in England, in London, were in favor of this. They hated Catholics. They were against popery. They were believing, uh, they looked back to the, the, the plot to blow up Parliament, Guy Fawkes and that terrible uh, plot. And so uh, Gordon moves to remove this uh, Catholic Relief Act and it failed. Parliament, to their credit, stood up to the people who were getting very ugly at this time. And so because of that, there were riots for days and they were ugly. People who were well-to-do, generally, um, suffered the most from this, as the, the crowd would sometimes go into someone's house, tear out all the furniture, and create a bonfire with it outside. They went to the jails, broke open the jails, three or four different jails, and released the prisoners. Uh, then they went to a gin distillery. <laughs> And, uh, and they enjoyed that tremendously, but uh, several of them died because of it, because they drank themselves to death. Anyway, um, as I say, the riot went on for days. The, the magistrates who were supposed to come out and read the riot act were too afraid to read the riot act, and so the soldiers couldn't fire on them. Finally, the king said, we've had enough. We need to send the troops in and fire anyway, even if you don't read the riot act, and they did. And so uh, somewhere around 300 uh, civilians were killed at that time. And if you'd like to read a book about it, came across that, the Gold Gordon Riots. And now the war finally is coming to an end. Cornwallis surrenders at Yorktown, uh, October 1781. The king, by the way, vowed to keep fighting, even though uh, it was a complete disaster. Everybody else knew that the game was up. The king said, no, we are going to fight on. Uh, North, the prime minister, uh, when he heard the news, they said he looked like he was someone who was shot in the chest, and he uh, went pacing back and forth, oh God. It's all over. And he ranted on for several minutes that way. And there's Yorktown. The king finally had to give in. Um, actually, the first vote that came up in February 1782, just a few months later, uh, was voted down by one vote. It was very close, but the writing was on the wall, and most people knew it. Uh, North urged the king, you've got to talk to the opposition. We've got to settle this. This is not going any further. Uh, the king thought he should resign, as in renounce or uh, give up his crown to his son. Uh, he thought that this humiliation was beyond anything that he should endure, and he was going to give up the crown and give it to his son. And then he thought about his son and thought better of it. His, his son was good at nothing but fashion and women. 
And um, so he, he realized he needed to stick it out. Um, so Lord North, who had been faithful, loyal uh, prime minister for, for 12 years, King George says to him, if you resign now, you will forever forfeit my regard. He was very angry. How can you abandon me at such a time? But North did. He resigned, 1782. Uh, King George tried very hard, unsuccessfully, to keep his pension from being paid to him. So the treaty, uh, they, they got a new ministry and cabinet. Uh, Rockingham came back several years later from the first time he was prime minister, uh, but then promptly died. Uh, so Shelburne becomes the prime minister, uh, and William Pitt the Younger uh, joins the cabinet. Becomes chancellor of the exchequer, and not too much later became the prime minister. The youngest prime minister in history uh, was William Pitt the Younger. Uh, some people say he was a chip off the old block, and uh, the, response, the first response to that was, no, he is the block. <laughs> he had all the talent, and then some, of his father. The peace treaty was signed uh, September 3rd, 1783. And there's William Pitt the Younger. His first few speeches in Parliament, uh, people would say he's going to be just as powerful as his father, and someone else would say, you know, I think he already is. <laughs> Treaty of Paris, signed, and this last bit. This was from that series, the HBO series. John Adams becomes the uh, ambassador to England. And so they have this encounter. And this is fairly accurate as to what was actually said for the most part. myself more fortunate than all of my fellow citizens in having the, the distinguishing honor to be the first to stand in your majesty's presence in a diplomatic character. I shall esteem myself the happiest of men if I can be instrumental in restoring the confidence and affection, or in better words, the good old nature and the good old humor between peoples who, though separated by an ocean and under different governments, have the same language, similar religion, and kindred blood. circumstances of this audience are so extraordinary. The language you have now held is so extremely proper 
and the feelings you have discovered so justly adapted to the occasion that I not only receive with pleasure the assurance of the friendly disposition of the United States, but that I am very glad that the choice has fallen on you to be their minister. I will be very frank with you. I was the last to consent to separation. But the separation having been made and having become inevitable, I have always said, as I say now, that I would be the first to meet the friendship of the United States as an independent power. Thank you, Your Majesty. There is an opinion among some people, Mr. Adams, that you are not the most attached of all your countrymen to the manners of France. <laughs> uh, yes, well, I avow to Your Majesty uh, that I have no attachment to, to any country but my own. An honest man will never have any other. I pray, Mr. Adams, that the United States does not suffer unduly from its want of a monarchy. <laughs> yes, we will, we will strive to answer those prayers, Your Majesty. George suffered terribly in his later years uh, from a, uh, an ailment. Uh, how many of you have seen that movie, uh, The Madness of King George? Yeah. I don't often recommend historical movies, but I do recommend this one. Not because it's entirely historically accurate, because it's not, but it gives the feel of the time better than most movies do. The, horrible sufferings that George endured from his mental illness and the horrific treatments that they imposed upon him were just, uh, it's just horrifying. Uh, but uh, yeah, in his later years, um, he went mad. And today, uh, he's been diagnosed with, um, how many of you know this one? I'm trying to think of the word, it's right on the tip of porphyry. my tongue. Porphyry. Porphyry. Yeah. Is that it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think his urine turned purple. Porphyry. Por. Porphyry. Porphyry. Something. Yeah. And um, it's it's an inherited genetic um, problem imbalance of uh, glands or something like that. Didn't he have extensive constipation too? Right? Yeah. Yeah. I think so. <laughs> Both but, hands uh, didn't work. <laughs> So, yeah, he went mad. In his last few years, um, he went blind and deaf, and he was, of course, crazy. And so his son did take over as regent uh, for the last few years. Um, so he died in uh, 1820. 
So any questions? Yes. Do you know if the uh, parents of John Wilkes Booth and Brad Wilkes were named their son after the original? You know, that, that's a good question. I wish I knew. That sounds like, sounds very plausible, doesn't it? Yeah. John Wilkes. Because he was a popular figure in America as well. John Wilkes and Liberty. Uh, the Americans really took up that cause of freedom of speech and to criticize your government. So he may have been. Anything else? Yes? When, when his children were young, he absolutely adored them. And most, more than most kings, uh, he was very uh, encouraging to his children when they were young. Unfortunately, they did not, most of them did not turn out uh, very well. Uh, they were um, very self-indulgent brats uh, as they grew up. And as I said, the eldest especially was well known as a womanizer, and he just loved to have a good time. Is that the history of it? it started with the first King George hating his son and hating his son because they were. Yeah. Yeah. Was yeah. <laughs> there another question? What? I, yeah. Um, back on the religious part of yes. that, you said that uh, George the Third was tolerant of the Methodists. Um, now they came, they were Hanoverian, you know, they were from Germany, where they were they when they came, they were Lutheran were yes. they Lutheran? Yes. Okay, but then they had to become the head of the Church of England. That's right, that's right. Okay, so um so the the grandfather and and all of that and then George the third. But that's like three three, four more generations down. Uh -huh. But uh, so he would have been raised in the Anglican Church, in it. Yes. Okay, yes. so he would have already, they they would have split from the Lutheran ties. Yeah, he was the I first one of them to I was wondering if that might have made born. him more tolerant because they were actually yeah. from another yeah. Yeah. religion. When it comes to uh, taking the crown uh, of another country, they could be a lot more tolerant uh, <laughs> yeah. because of that, yeah. Okay. Anything else? Yes. Yes. You know, I don't know. Uh, I haven't looked into that. His son, it, who became king, did not. Uh, I have not heard of any other uh, of his descendants in that. And there actually, by the way, there is some controversy. Um, some historians who have looked into this will say that uh, it really wasn't por porphyry. Porphyry, I think that's pronounced. Um, that it was just a uh, kind of a, a form of schizophrenia. Yeah. So it may not have been. Of course, schizophrenia runs in the yeah. family as well. Uh, his madness was not constant. It came and went. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Benedict Garner next week. How do you spell that? Good job. P O R P H Y O R Y. P -O -R -P -H -Y. P -O -R -P -H -Y.